Welcome back to the Context Coaching Podcast. We are joined today by Jen Brooks, Athletic Director at Ursuline Academy in St. Louis, Missouri. Thanks for being here today. Appreciate talking to you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Let's dive in. So, Jen, take us through your background. How'd you get into this whole endeavor? I know we were just talking off camera a little bit about it, and it's unique. But why don't you uh, walk us through the journey, how you got into high school athletics, where it's taking you, and uh, what the different steps along the way have been. Sure. So I think it starts back when I was little. Um, and I was totally involved in, you know, athletics as a kid growing up, but also my dad was uh, a high school football coach um, and ended up being my high school athletic director. So, you know, many evenings I spent um, shooting hoops in the backyard and he rebounded or I pitched to him and he caught me. Um, and then I spent my Saturdays on his football sidelines. Right. So, you know, all that was um, in uh, that went into the high school football game. I was a part of from morning to dusk and I loved every piece of that. Um, and then, you know, I saw the relationships that he had with his kids, with his players, you know, having them over for dinner at our house, which doesn't really happen these days, but back in the days, you know, that was a cool thing to see. Um, and then my dad was my high school athletic director. Um, so I knew that when it came time to deciding where I wanted to go in life and what I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to have a positive difference in a young person's life, specifically probably females, and thought my best avenue for doing that would be uh, through high school sports and high school athletics and teaching. So, But I was like, what am I going to teach, though? Because I'm not good at math at all. I can't remember anything. So history's out. Um, English, I love to read, but that whole grammar thing, I'm not so sure of. And so I landed on theology and thought, okay, you know, I'll make God cool. I'll teach him how to be a good person. And I can use, use the avenue of sports. And so um, I actually graduated uh, college in three years. I played three sports in college, um, graduated in three years, and um, applied to Ursuline um, as, as a 20-year-old young person. And so when I came here to Ursuline, um, sister was interviewing me for a part-time theology job and looked me up and down literally and said, you look healthy. Why don't you teach health? And so I said, okay, because I wanted a full-time job. So I was teaching full-time here at Ursuline. I was coaching basketball here. And then I was assistant soccer and softball coach back at the university I graduated from. Um, meanwhile, I reached out to the athletic director here at Ursuline at the time and said, hey, if you ever need any help, like I'm happy to help you. And lo and behold, um, two years into being here at Ursuline, the athletic director experienced this really traumatic pregnancy situation, and she had to step away. And so this 24-year-old young person, or maybe I was 26 at the time, stepped in with no experience at all and became the athletic director. And I sit here in front of you, 30 years into my career at Ursuline, 28 as the athletic director, saying, oh my goodness, I learned a lot on the job. <laughs> Yeah, I can only imagine. And uh, we're going to definitely talk about a few of those things. But before we do, let's go back to this three sports as a college athlete. Um, today, that would be a complete and utter outlier. And I'm sure that years ago, it also was probably an outlier. Talk a little bit about that experience and how you were able to pull that off. Yeah, so I went, that was not the intention going into it. I was originally recruited to play basketball. And so that was my plan. And about two weeks before my freshman year in college, the basketball coach was also the soccer coach, which again is an outlier these days. Um, and he called me and said that he had a few injuries on the soccer team and he knew I had played soccer and um, would I be willing to help um, for a couple of weeks. And at that point I said, sure. You know, and, and I will tell you at that point, I had kind of been burned out. I had played three sports in high school. I, I just was kind of a little burnt out. But at that point, I had enough time off. I had a few, you know, my summer off. So I was a little bit refreshed. So I went in and I played soccer. And I was like, I loved it so much. I actually made the all-conference team. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I don't need to, like, leave after two weeks. This is a blast. I'm I'm good. So I did that. And then I played basketball. Meanwhile, the softball coach had seen me play basketball and soccer and knew he, I played softball in college or in high school. And he wanted me to play softball. And so I said, Sure. Um, I don't sit still very well. I don't know. I don't like downtime. So it worked for me. Um, 
And so, yeah, so, but then I will tell you that my, um, so then that was my first year of college. Like I said, I did college in three years. So my second year of college, I played soccer. I got, I hurt my knee playing soccer and ended up having to have surgery at the end of soccer season. And so I couldn't play basketball. So I asked my coach, I'm like, Hey, can you please help me find a job? Like I need money during this off season now that I can't play basketball. And he got me a job down the street at the local high school as a gym supervisor. So on my first day as a gym supervisor, I'm there with my crutches, my leg in a full brace and everything. And I sit down ready to supervise the gym. And I can hear the athletic director in the room next door say, I need a freshman basketball coach like now. So I crazily hopped over on my crutches and said, I'll do it. <laughs> and so what am I like 19 now? And I'm hired to coach the freshman basketball team. Um, so I did that. And, um, and I actually, it's crazy. It's comes full circle now where I've had one of my members of that team, her daughters actually come to Ursuline and graduated from Ursuline. So I've been around that long now that that's happening. Um, and so then, yeah, that, that whole coaching thing, I think that, that bit me into, you know, my love of being a part of high school sports. And that's, that's my story. No, that's great. And the reason I asked as a follow-up is twofold. Number one, you graduate in three years, you're playing three sports. Obviously, that takes a little bit modicum of uh, organization. Um, but also, as you have now transitioned into the leadership role at your school, how have you prioritized or continued to model and encourage multi-sport athletics in the age of sports specialization? Yeah. So I, you know, work with my coaches all the time and remind them that, um, that that's, what's best for our young woman. Right. So, I mean, I'm at a school where we don't really, I mean, we've never had a professional athlete come out of here. Maybe one day we'll get one. So the reality of it is, is we're dealing with young women who just want a good solid sport experience. And so by us providing multiple opportunities for them to experience sports and succeed in sports, that's what these young women need, right? Um, and so, you know, it's reminding my coaches to give them grace when they can't make a preseason workout because they're in a current season. Um, it's reminding, it's reminding my athletes and their parents to say, it's all good. They're they're not going to miss anything out. They're not going to not make this team because they missed this preseason warm up. Um, and, you know, and they're going to be better prepared for soccer if they're playing basketball now and vice versa. So it's this constant reminder, this constant education to everybody, to all the people involved, to my coaches, to my players, to my parents. You know, everybody's so stuck on college scholarships that they lose a lot of what's really important. And I think it's my job to remind them what's really important. Well, on that note, and I'm on my soapbox now and I apologize, but the reality of the collegiate scholarship situation has shifted dramatically in the last couple of years. But even before so, the amount of money that often families are spending chasing that outweighs what aid they're actually receiving from the school. So how do you help recenter in an era where the outside noise is selling something that's not real? Right. What do those conversations look like? Do you have any stories you can share on some successes there? You know, they're honest, frank conversations. And I'll tell you that, you know, I feel like I'm a seasoned veteran, so I have nothing to lose or I have all this wisdom to give. So I'm not afraid to say that's absolutely ridiculous. You know that. And, and so one of the things we actually do here in Missouri and within our league is just, in fact, it happened just last week, is we bring in um, a handful of college soccer coaches. So soccer is big in our area. So D1, D2, D3, NAIA, all those things. We bring these college coaches in, and we have them talk about what they look for in a recruit. We talk about how they recruit, and they do not speak highly of the club sports scene. They do not speak highly of the thousands and thousands of dollars that these parents are wasting on you know, these college scouting purposes, all of these ID camps, all those things, they give, they really gave them the honest truth about all those things. So providing our parents with those things is huge. Um, and then just me simply reminding them that, you know, the amount of money that you're spending, like they'll tell me, oh, you know, we have to leave tomorrow for, you know, this tournament out in California. 
and we're the, uh, the tons of money that they're spending on that. I'm like, you know, you don't have to go to that tournament and you can put that money towards college and it's all going to be okay. And, and, you know, having the courage to say that to these pa parents, it took me a while to get there, but I think that's so important, you know, and so that's, it's just having, it's just telling these people, like you got your priorities wrong and educating them, right? I don't think they even realize that these scholarships that land on my desk that these kids get are just a few thousand dollars. And in the realm of the world, that means nothing. Yeah, well, and it's not to knock that for either of us, right? It's just the reality of the, there's only a handful of fully funded sports. And most of these uh, organizations that are playing year round aren't even in those sports. You're in the equivalency sports where to your point, you're getting a quarter of a scholarship, right? You're getting a half at max. And yet that's where the majority of this money is being spent chasing the these dreams, which God forbid, like keep chasing, but like get the reality before you, you take your limited resources and throw them around. I don't want to sit on this too long and go all day, but let's pivot back to when you first started coaching, when you first got into the AD seat, what are some of the first things you realized right away that you weren't ready for and you had to figure out quickly? I'll tell you the biggest challenge for me, and even it still exists in some ways today, is that I'm a female working in this male-dominated sports world. So that's been really huge. So imagine being 26 years old, being this young woman, and having to deal with parents who are who could have been my parents, um, coaches who were older than me. Um, and, and so it's only been in the last few years that I don't feel like I have imposter syndrome anymore. I feel like I belong here. I feel like I deserve to be here. Um, but I've spent most of my life in meetings with all men and, and dealing with parents who think they are dealing with dads who think they know more than me, which is ironic because I was a female athlete. So if anyone can relate to a female athlete, it's going to be me before them, you know? So um, figuring out how to be in this space of high school sports as a woman has been my biggest challenge. Yeah. And I would imagine that you've figured out some techniques to navigate that. And you've had some aha moments over the years. What would you offer to other women that are entering this space that are still pushing against that? Because it it's still a male dominated space and, and the ability of both women and people of color to crack into things that are traditionally dominant in other areas. How do you navigate that? What advice do you have uh, for others that are in your shoes? I would say first and foremost, know that you deserve to be there, that we need you in that space. We need women. We need people who don't look like the white men to be sitting at those tables because our, our experience and our opinion is important. The, the athletes that we serve aren't all young white men. So, you know, we have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, you have to have the courage when you enter those spaces to know that you belong there and the courage to find your voice. And so, you know, um, to volunteer for things, to get involved when something is wrong to say it's wrong. Um, and, and the big piece too is to find your allies. You know, I wouldn't be in this space and this frame of mind if I didn't have these great male allies that helped open doors for me. Um, and now I have the courage to, you know, call out people who aren't or are closing doors in my face. I don't let that happen anymore. Um, and, and so it's a big piece is, is, is courage. So on your screen, those of you that are not watching, you have something that says bring your bravery. So talk a little bit about that in regards to navigating both the coaching space, the athletic director space, the school administration space, just all of those areas where you just mentioned you're in the minority. You have to find allies. How how has some of that um, I'm, just, I'm politicking, let's call it, uh, benefited you and what are some uh, tips and tricks that you could offer to people in regards to, hey, look, this is kind of how you navigate this space early until you get your footing and until you've kind of earned the social capital of the room, not only because you're a woman, but because you're new and you're young, you're in this space and there are veterans that tend to control things. You know, for me, I need, you know, even though I've done this for a long time now, I still need that reminder, right? So that's why I have it up there to bring my bravery. Um, and, you know, 
get educated. So become, a, you know, get, know your job and do it well. So I got my certifications. I've taken all the classes. You know, I really made an effort to learn how to be the best athletic director that I could. And I'm continuously learning, right? So I'm never just content with today. I want to be better tomorrow. So I think that's important. Um, I think it's important to, to, to be vulnerable and to be authentic, you know, and, and modeling for the young woman that I work with is important too. And even my coaching staff, like I don't have to be right all the time, you know, and for me to have the courage to say, you know what, I was wrong and that's a great idea or, or I'm sorry, that's, I shouldn't have not have done that or said that. I think that's important. Um, so I don't claim to be perfect. I don't claim to know it all. So I, I think that um, if people can walk into those spaces, knowing that, um, but yet doing those things every day to try to become better, to learn more, to, you know, to do better. I think that's, that's how you navigate those spaces. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's, as we've discussed on this show, 200 episodes almost worth is the people with a little more wisdom and experience over the years, either, either earned or just beaten into them over the, the 25 years of doing this is that you, you don't, you don't really know anything and you're constantly trying to figure out what's next and, and how you navigate a new situation as they present yourself. So I think that's important, right? Ask questions. Hey, I'm a new person. How do I do this? Um, and, and the bravery it takes to do that is always a good reminder. Um, on your campus as the head of programs, uh, you get an opportunity to watch your coaches work. You get a chance to interact with your athletes. Um, I generally ask kind of what's the best thing you do as a coach in your program that creates the largest ripple effect on the culture you're trying to build. But in your case, I'm curious if you have a handful of things that your teams do or that you do overarching that you would like to share with others. Like, hey, this has been really transformational um, in regards to helping this team uh, build the culture that they want or helping our program kind of rise above and have some consistency? So two things I, I want to talk about. The first is that we um, really emphasize being a person of high character here. And I talk about that, that I'll take a young woman who um, is, you know, it's teammates first, right? So I want that young woman who's going out, who's doing above and beyond to be the best teammate they can be. I'd rather start that kid or play that kid or give that kid more playing time than the kid who's scoring the most goals, but is selfish and is not a nice person. Like that has no space in our program. So I preach that constantly. Um, and I talk about that all the time. Um, the other thing is I, is I have a model um, model that's called This Is Good. Um, and the idea behind This Is Good, it's a whole story, Google it. Um, but what I pull out of it is high school sports is so filled with emotions, good, bad, otherwise, right? So how do we level that? How do we not make this just so intense? Well, it's, we find the good. So when someone gets this, you know, horrific, catastrophic accident, they tear their ACL. How do we find the good in a torn ACL, right? And again, I remind them, you're not going to find the good today. It may not even be tomorrow. It may not even be a year, but at some point in your life, you're going to recognize the good that you can find some good in that situation. And then the other thing is, okay, you know, um, when we do good, sometimes we just overlook the good because we're moving on to the next thing. So let's be in the moment. Let's celebrate the good. Let's honor the good um, and, and be happy with that. Like we always want more too. So let's just kind of be, you know, in that space of this is good. And, and so there'll be so many times where I'll be in a conversation with a kid and they'll just look at, we'll walk, you know, it'd be, and it might be a hard conversation, but at the end, the kid will go, this is good coach. This is good. And so it works. They're hearing it. Right. Um, and, and when we win championships, they get around the trophy and they're like, this is good. This is good. You know? So there, I think that's one of the most important things I can bring to these kids because, you know, especially kids today, they're, they're fraught with anxiety. Right. So if we can just say, Hey, this little thing, that's good. Or this thing that's really hard. I promise you, it's going to make you a better person. There's good in this and having those conversations. Yeah, no, that's a great perspective. And uh, hearing you tell that story, I'm over here chuckling um, that it it takes root like that. But those are the important things, right? Like, how do you figure out um, how to have alignment, right, within your team or within your program? And the fact that you've been able to embed that across all of your different disciplines is really impressive. What would you say as you coached 
multiple sports, as you played multiple sports, and now you're overseeing multiple sports, what have you seen and learned from other programs that you've been able to both internalize as a teacher and an educator, but also to offer up to somebody else, right? Where it's like, hey, I know you coach tennis, but the volleyball team was doing this the other day and it's worth checking out. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things I do with my coaching staff. I have great coaches and they're doing great things. And so when we have our meetings, um, I will say, hey, Jeff, you're, I, I love what you're doing with the volleyball team. I need you to share that with everybody else. You know, hey, Nora, you're doing this great thing with how you do preseason stuff with your kids. I want you to share that with everybody else. So we don't have to look far. Greatness exists within. Um, sometimes we just overlook that um, and take and or take it for granted. Um, and I, so I think that's important to share, but also like then to remind. So when I ask Jeff and Nora to share that, I'm also acknowledging, hey, you're doing great things. And and it's my job to make sure that I do acknowledge that. Right. As the coaches, it's not just the, it's the kids that need to be acknowledged for good things. My coaching staff needs to be acknowledged as well. So I think that's important. Are there any specifics that you could offer the greater world that's listening? Like you mentioned the preseason thing or whatever else that you have in your pocket. That's just like, hey. You know what? It doesn't matter what sport it is. This thing will will make a difference for you. One of the things I've learned with athletes in these last few years is that they really value the relationship piece, right? And we have to do a better job of defining that the relationship of them on the court and the relationship of, of, of them off the court, right? Because they think that if I get mad at them on the court, that I can't like them off the court. And those just, that's not true. So we have to work on that relationship piece. And so one of the things that one of my coaches, Nora, does is preseason with her basketball team. She has them fill out this, um, this survey, right, or this form and ask them a ton of questions. And some of it is things like, you know, how, how do you want to be coached? You know, specific, and specifically tell me what are things that you want to hear out of my mouth and what are things that you don't want to hear? Because you do have some of the kids who want to be yelled at and you have some of the kids who absolutely do not want to be yelled at. And then mixes things in there that are silly and non-basketball related, like what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite food? You know, all these kinds of things. And then takes that information, shares it with the rest of the staff, but then is purposeful about, about taking that information and intermixing it throughout the season. So, you know, when she finds the time to say, you know, like if a kid says Gilmore Girls is my favorite show, then she finds a time to quote Gilmore Girls. And they're like, oh, wait, wow, she actually you know, she connected with me. So making those connections is huge. And so, you know, how is it? Maybe it's a survey, maybe it's having conversations, whatever it is, find ways to make connections with your athletes. I promise you they will grow through, they'll run through a brick wall if they do. Yeah, no, that's intriguing. So I've given out surveys that are asking basketball questions, right? Like, who do you think the best lineup is, right? How many minutes do you think you should be playing? All of those things to kind of level set roles and norms, but novel throwing in these other things that can give you a little bit more insight that might allow you to get into that relationship in a way that best serves that kid. I love that. Any other ideas? Oh, you put me on the spot right now. Um, All you know good. We'll come back to it. You think about it in the background. Let's go here. Um, as a 20 year old getting into being a full-time teacher and then a early twenties into the full-time AD, right? You're generally swimming upstream, just trying to keep your head above water and figuring it out as you go. But if you, if you reflect now, and you look back, um, how has your approach changed? Uh, and what are some things you would do differently if you had a do-over? Gosh, that's hard. You know, my first year as athletic director, I was still teaching full time. And I ne neglected to tell you this, I was pregnant with my daughter. So, you know, I'm having my first pregnancy, I'm teaching, you know, full time and first year as an athletic director. Wow, that was crazy. Um, I have gotten better at delegating. I have gotten better at prioritizing me. You know, so um, I really, I, you know, I mentor a lot of um, athletic directors. And even I tell this with my coaching staff, you know, I no longer get email notifications on my phone because otherwise that would just be a nonstop ding, right? So for my mental health, that doesn't happen. And I tell my coaching staff, this is how you communicate with me. If you, 
need something like a new uniform or the dance room needs to be cleaned or whatever, send me an email. That's my, my email is my to-do list. If something crazy just happened, someone got hurt, a parent went crazy, whatever the situation might be, it's urgent and, or you just need a yes or no answer, send me a text. Okay. And, or call me. Um, and so I don't, I tell myself and I try not to look at my phone much past eight, eight thirty, or at least checking my email. Cause I don't need that email from a parent to just really turn me off and not and have a sleepless night because I'm mad at the ignorance of this parent because let's be honest that's what it is um there I said it um so so I'm I've gotten better about protecting myself <laughs> you're laughing so good. when, you, when I, you've I'm done laughing. this job for long enough you get a little courageous and you can say you can call it out oh man yeah I'm laughing at the week that I had last week so go ahead keep going yeah. So just, you know, but I've learned to better protect myself and prioritize myself. Um, there are situations I'm more compassionate. I'm more empathetic, um, probably because I've experienced a lot of things. I've seen it. Um, I've learned that in the realm of the world, most of the stuff really doesn't matter. Truly. Right. The the awards, the trophies, that stuff is forgotten. It's the relationships it's the experiences that are really are what remember what's remembered. And so I need to do a better job in those situations as opposed to the trophies. Yes. And the things that you mentioned that are transferable other than kind of the high level conceptual are the systems that you described in training people to interact with you. And what you said, I don't have email notifications, neither do I. I feel like I'm an outlier. And I tell my my uh, assistant and my colleagues, like, turn that off. Like, at the end of the day, batch your emails. I check them in the morning. If I'm in the office, they're up. If not, I check them again at noon. And then I check them again before I go home. But to your point, if it's urgent and you want a response, like, email is not the way. Like text me, like call me, I'll get back to you right away. But there's a uh, there's a skill or there's a, a need for you to train the people that are working with you, both downline and upline, right? And, and this is how you're going to get a response. And ultimately, those that are paying attention, you can set your own boundaries and how you want to be interacted with as long as they make sense and it keeps the student at the center of things still, right? You can't just choose not to respond to things because you don't want to deal with it. But uh, it's funny when you were saying that I was laughing because that's exactly how I shut it off. And um, the other piece I think you mentioned is um, ultimately how we interact with parents and how we help coach them on allowing their kids to self-advocate. Because this is the transformational time where they're getting ready to go off to college where they're going to be on their own. And, hey, are you going to email their college professor? It's like, no. So, like, let's start working on that right now. Can you talk a little bit about techniques and tips and tools for um, working in partnership with them rather than having some sort of adversarial relationship? Yeah, I think that's so important because, you know, for years being young, and inexperienced, I was scared to have those conversations. Um, I've had, and I, and, and so I, I, ha I have my, my, I have adult kids right now. So I say I have kids, but they're adults. So, you know, I have a daughter who's 26 and a son who's 23 who played high school sports, one played collegiately. So I, I have that experience. And so in my preseason meetings with these parents, I no longer talk about, you know, turn your uniform in on time, follow the rules, don't drink, don't do drugs. I don't say that. I, it's all changed now to, let me tell you about who Jen Brooks is. Let me tell you about my philosophy. Let me tell you about, I'm here at this place because I've lived it for this many years. I've been a high school sport parent. So I know exactly how you're feeling right now. Um, and, and let me help you navigate what life is like as a high school sport parent. Um, and so some of them utilize me. Some of them, I force them to utilize and hear my conversations and my words um, and so, but I think it's my job. It's my duty. That's just how I, I live as a person. I want to help people. Um, and, and so I will do my best to share my knowledge. If you choose to, to ignore it, that's on you and I'm not going to lose sleep over it. Um, but at least I've tried. Yeah. Well, I think that's important because often what 
I have found is that your parents, our parents, who have competed and have played at a high level, generally are the ones that are sitting in the top row of bleachers in the corner, staying away from everybody, letting people do their job. And then you have others that their intentions are really good, but they don't understand the impact that their actions are having in their attempt to help in whatever way. And sometimes it's just a miscommunication. And and sometimes you have to call out like, hey, what was your intention with this? Well, I just wanted to, well, that's not how it landed. Let me tell you how it landed. And ultimately, how do we work moving forward to make sure that your intention and the impact it is having are in alignment? Um, so I think that's great that you spell that out right at the beginning. It's probably helpful and it, it humanizes you and it allows people to come to you uh, with curiosity rather than with, you know, ideas that maybe haven't been fully formed yet. Yep, exactly. Um, all right, let me ask this. This is, and we'll, we'll kind of wrap with this so you can get back to your day. But I always ask, what is something you've most recently changed your mind on? And it's really kind of out of the growth mindset approach of, hey, look, I used to be over here and really dug in and this is how we do this. And, and, and now I'm over here and here's why. Like there was a real reason for me to shift, even though I used to be kind of up, up against that. And it doesn't have to be about sports. It's kind of an open-ended, just kind of like, how are we constantly reevaluating our belief system? Well, I, you know, for, for me, I would say that we have a, a, a specific instance right now where my cheer team just won state and prior to competing in the actual state competition, two of the cheerleaders uh, got injured. They tore their ACLs and couldn't compete in, in the state competition. And, you know, so moving forward now I'm putting the, you know, I'm getting the banner together, getting them their state ranks. And I'm including those two young women who had the injuries. And I am getting such negative feedback from other parents that are unhappy that these young women are getting their name on the banner and getting a ring because they didn't compete in state. And Jen years ago may have thought that as well, right? You know, I think I could have been, I think I could have been in a space maybe that I didn't see the value in all of that. And I tell them they're absolutely wrong. You know, that um, first off, we, you know, these kids didn't choose to get hurt. They would have been in that competition had they not been hurt. Let's offer some grace. Let's offer some compassion and and just kind of go through that whole teaching process of, you know, um, in the realm of the world, this does not matter if their name's on the banner or they get a ring, but they were a part of that team and they would have been a part of that team and they not got hurt. So it's educating people in that space. So I think that I've grown in that sense of being more compassionate, giving myself grace, giving other people more grace. I think that's, that's, I mean, look at my, my, I mean, I've been doing this for 28 years. So I have a huge growth pattern right here where I think, you know, 26 year old Jen at this chair might've said, well, yeah, do they really deserve because they didn't compete? I could see where I was that naive and that competitive and that, you know, not wise. And now I'm like, without a doubt, their name's going on that banner. So being willing to be more grace filled and more compassionate, I think has made me a better athletic director. Well, I think that just speaks to being aware of all of the various pieces that make up a team. It's like, you're not winning the state championship without those kids participating along the way. And they didn't quit. Like they got hurt. Right. And and so ultimately I hear you. And I feel like, there's a certain aspect of um, how do we say our, our athletes would tell us we are soft, but what the reality is, is we are more experienced in that the things years ago, 25 years ago, it's like, yo, you missed practice. You're off the team uh, right. to now where I have a kid who was like, coach, look, I'm not going to be there Monday. I'm like, why not? Well, my parents are taking me to Arizona to see my grandparents. And it's like, okay. Like at the end of the day, what am I supposed to do? Like she didn't make that choice, you know? And, and so like, Oh, I can punish the parents to like stick it to them. And it's like, what for? Like at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I'm, 
my grandparents have all passed. Like, if I could see them again, you think I don't want to? Like, go ahead, enjoy that, right? And I think, uh, how do we as coaches and, and athletic directors uh, stick to our principles, but change with the times, right? What is What does that look like? Uh, do you have anything to offer there as we close? You know, I always say, trust your gut, number one, right? Um, and remember that in the realm of the world, that game, that practice really doesn't matter, you know, but if you're giving that kid that experience to go on this vacation with their grandparents to Hawaii or whatever the case might be, that's what's making memories. Um, you know, keeping things in perspective and, and, and that's really hard because what some people have is their perspective of what my, in mine is are two different things. And, um, I think just knowing that life is bigger than sports, right? So keep that in mind as you make these decisions and as you know, you're making decisions that are gonna, in some ways, greatly impact these young people in this moment and potentially down the road, you know, what's it for? What does it matter? Is it really that important? And, and I think you'll find your answer. Yeah, and, and I'll also wrap with this because it comes from all different directions. I was having a conversation with a parent last week and our spring break is probably like yours it's longer than normal and and ultimately we have a sophomore wilderness trip that that comes before it so the, the kid was a little worried about missing three weeks of of her spring season and then part of it was like hey and you know I'm, I'm, i got this this trip on hold where i'm going for work to japan and and i was inviting her and she doesn't want to go and i'm like i the, the kid plays for me i grabbed the kid i'm like yo you need to go to japan it's like, but I don't want to miss this. I said, look, it's going to be there when you get back. Like your opportunity to go do this is going to live with you longer than whatever you just did at practice. Right. And so I think that's so important though, because they, we, they need that permission from us. So we, re, we need to remember that, that we hold that power and that we have to use it wisely and fairly. No doubt. And I think that's where to my former athletes, perception we're soft but to my um I have now had kids go through and they have graduated and they never missed a thing but at the same time it's like I now understand what that high school experience is like and what they were giving up and what you know if they had asked and they wanted to do things where I don't absolutely hell can, can I go like it's you know the things that we would be intrigued by it's like well why are we getting in the way of these kids doing that I love what you just said. Why are we getting in the way? We have to remember to do that. We have to get out of the way. No doubt. All right, Jen. Well, I appreciate you being on. Uh, if people want to learn more about Ursuline Athletics, where can they look? They can go to UrsulineSTL.org. That's our website for the St. Louis Ursuline Academy. It's fantastic. Well, looking forward to uh, seeing you next year. And thanks for jumping on. Appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. This has been fun.